Good afternoon, everyone, at least in European zone. Uh, welcome to this Biochemical Society and Portland Press uh, webinar series. It's a part of the Biochemistry Focus webinar series. Topics in the series include different research areas in molecular biosciences and also practical sessions to support uh, early career development um, for scientists. In each webinar, you will have uh, opportunity to ask questions at the end, uh, so not after the talks, but at the end of the webinar. And we also welcome all suggestions for the future topics and also the speakers. Uh, if you want to learn more details, uh, I invite you to our website, which is on the uh, on the slide. So my name is Krzysztof Wicher. I'm a head of drug discovery for the small biotech company called Macomics. We work with the macrophages to try to modulate their phenotype in cancer and the other diseases. So this particular webinar is a part of our dedicated early career research uh, program in of webinars. And we are delighted to provide this opportunity to Camila, Renato and Ruth, and they will share their work um, uh, performed at the, at the institutions at the moment. So today's webinar is titled Cellular Behavior in Disease Models, and we will hear about different projects spanning from complex 3D models for cancer and to very detailed molecular methods for the drug discovery. Um, so before I hand over to our first speaker, to Camila, I would like to mention that questions, as I said before, will be asked at the end of the webinar. So please send them in the in the chat in the questions uh, uh, section of the of the go to webinar control panel, and uh, please mention to whom the question is addressed to, so that we don't have the confusion and we ask the right person the question, and then we'll try to answer as many of them as possible at the end. All right. So without the further ado, please. Uh, Welcome our first speaker today. It's Camilla Ceruti from the European Institute of Oncology. She graduated the medical biochemistry at biotechnology at the University of Milan, Icoca, and she completed her master's in science in pharmacogenomic biotechnology in 2009. And she, then she went to, to do the her PhD in neurovascular immunology. And then she, she was studying, uh, uh, she, she is now recipient of the ICAR, uh, a fellowship uh, in the uh, to develop the project single cell epigenetic and molecular signatures in human breast cancer metastasis formation and she works in professor pierre giuseppe pellicci lab in the european institute of oncology in milan so the title of today's talk is 2d and 3d human vasculature models to study cancer cell adhesion and migration during metastasis formation please camilla Good afternoon. Thank you very much to give me the opportunity to present today to the ERC webinar series Cellular Behavior and Disease Models. And as I said, I will present a 2D and, 2D and 3D human vasculature model to study cancer cell adhesion and migration during metastasis. The process of metastasis is complicated and very inefficient. However, it is still the cause of 90% of cancer-related deaths. The metastasis formation is a multi-step cascade where cells from the primary tumor invade and intravasate in the vasculature, here became circulating tumor cells, and then eventually adhere to endothelial cells of the vasculature of the organ target. Then here extravasate and form pre-metastatic niches, micrometastasis, and then colonize all the organs. In the case of breast cancer, that is the most common cancer in women worldwide, um, metastasis developed in the, uh, develops in the liver, in the bone, and also in the brain and in the lung. So the uh, firm adhesion event of metastasis is very difficult to study in vivo. Therefore, a uh, model to study cancer interaction with endothelial cells in a controlled way are needed. It has been shown uh, that uh, in the clinical phase, uh, uh, the treatment that arrived from, derived from murine models or uh, cell monoculture phase, while it has been shown that 90% of treatments um, that were successfully uh, when tested either in organoids or 3D tissue models or microfluidics succeeded in clinical trial phase. 
Therefore, we decided to study the firm adhesion that happened under the fluid shear stress in vivo, um, developing two, uh, a 2D and a 3D microfluidic system. The 2D microfluidic system, in collaboration with the Polytechnic of Milan, with uh, two talented students, uh, Virginia and uh, Ariane. The 2D model uh, is starting from a commercially available platform where we cultivate endothelial cells. Uh, as you can see here, is a monolayer of uh, U UVEC, uh, primary umbilical vein endothelial cells, brain microvascular endothelial cells, and primary lung microvascular endothelial cells. And then uh, to study the interaction of this vasculature with uh, cancer cells, we label green the cancer cells, and then we connect these cancer cells with uh, the commercially available chamber and with a pump that pull cancer cells through uh, the chamber to let the cancer cells interact with the endothelial cells that are seeded in the chamber for five minutes uh, as a slow uh, pace with a low shear stress. Then after five minutes, there is a switch to challenge this adhesion with a higher speed of higher uh, shear stress. All this happen inside an inverted time-lapse microscope and the three images a second were taken and then um, a movie is renderized like this one as you can see on your uh, left um, you will see uh, endothelial cells monolayer i hope so and uh, you will see on the right part cancer cells uh, flowing in the chamber uh, at low shear stress and then in this accumulation time of five minutes, cancer cells adhere to endothelial cells. As you can see, there are this, uh, all these cancer cells adhere to endothelial cells. Then the shear stress is increased to challenge this adhesion, and the cancer cells that remain adhere are defined like firmly adhere to cancer cells to endothelial cells. We uh, routinely, routinely um, uh, use this 2D all human in vitro microfluidic model uh, to study cancer interaction with endo different and organ specific endothelium. And these, as you can see, are cancer cells, primary cancer cells from patients that are adhering to this endothelium. We use this model to study a single cell RNA seq signature. So the firmly adhered cancer cells were harvested and reached, and then uh, thanks to uh, you, uh, sorry, and reached uh, and single cell RNA seq signature studied using the 10x genomics platform. Then uh, we also uh, developed, uh, fabricated actually, uh, in collaboration with Polytechnico, a 3D all human in vitro microfluidic model. Uh, this uh, chip is made by two layers, a tank layer and a channel layer. And this is the AutoCAD design where you can see that there is the middle channel and the two lateral reservoir uh, in order to obtain a cylindrical geometry, uh, so a vasculature, a monolayer with a cylindrical geometry, a 3D structure, a multicellular co-culture um, under shear stress and with the direct contact of different uh, cell types and with the two lateral uh, additional channel for media uh, for the nutrients on top of this uh, uh, central uh, line. First thing, so we, uh, these are endothelial cells um, and we checked whether actually we could obtain a cylindrical geometry. And as you can see, uh, the cells grow as a monolayer forming a perfect cylinder. And then we checked uh, uh, whether these cells uh, in the 3D all human in vitro microfluidic model express uh, CD31, PECAM1, uh, that, a marker for endothelium, and uh, also uh, if uh, they were uh, expressing a junctional VE cadherin uh, protein, VDV cadherin. 
Here more in particular, these are four tiles, uh, is a Z-stack, four tiles uh, confocal, where here in yellow you can see a nice net of v cadering expression of uh, this uh, endothelial monolayer, and the same for Z1, uh, that form a nice net, so the cells uh, form actually a barrier. Further, we also studied it in uh, uh, brain endothelial cells. For example, here is uh, the V. cadirin. As you can see, uh, here there is a net uh, forming, uh, so the, uh, the cells have a nice belt of V. cadirin, and also the, the monolayer forms a perfect cylindrical uh, geometry. Here are the maximal projection of Z1 and V cadirin that we studied. And then we also checked, uh, we studied whether we can use the full length for experimental quantification. And the answer is yes, because V cadirin is expressed along all uh, the five millimeter length of the channel. We then tested with using a fitzidextran for kilodalton, the barrier permeability, adding add in the inlet uh, the four, fits, four kilodalton fitzidextran in a uh, control channel where there is the 3D uh, channel gel without cells. And you can see that the dextran is diffusing in the chip. And why, when the endothelial cells from brain and primary UEC are present, uh, the dextrant is maintained in the compartment, as here quantified. Um, obtained uh, the first layer, the monolayer, we wanted to further go ahead working on the, a 3D or human in vitro microfluidic model of brain microvasculature that is formed by the neurovascular unit composed by endothelial cells, pericyte, and astrocyte. So we add the pericyte, and as you can see here, in 72 hours, we were able to find the pericyte in the gel migrating towards the cylindrical monolayer of endothelial cells. Then we studied the interaction of cancer cells with the endothelial cells at different speed. And as you can see, cells adhered and flowed uh, in the uh, 3D microfluidic model. And here you can see actually the uh, uh, firmly uh, adhered cancer cells to the uh, endothelium in the 3D model. So future direction are, of course, to further develop the microfluidic 3D human vascular model with a co and tree culture of cells. In the case of the brain, we would like to add pericytes and astrocytes on top of our, uh, to our engineered 3D model that is all human, organ-specific, perfusable with a geometry that mimics cylindrical vasculature in vivo, and of course uh, fits in the ethic of the three R's with the replacement, reduction, and refinement for uh, research. Uh, then increase the type of organ-specific vasculature to study cancer cell adhesion under stress and explore cancer cell migration across uh, organ-specific vasculature uh, on top of cell adhesion. And with this, I would like to thank, uh, to thank the Pier Giuseppe Pellici Lab, uh, the Rasponi Lab at the Politecnico, our collaborator at the Open University and Cambridge University, uh, my funding of the Marie Curie uh, Eye Care uh, Horizon 2020, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Camilla, for a very interesting talk. Uh, we'll now switch uh, gears and we'll have our second uh, uh, second speaker. I just want to remind uh, attendees that we you can ask questions in the in the chat panel there, so that we can ask them at the end to to all the speakers. Right. So, are we waiting for another? 
I will introduce him. Okay, so uh, Renato uh, is from University of São Paulo in Brazil. He studied medicine at the Federal University of Maranhão in, in Brazil before completing his PhD at the University of Reading, where he was deciphering uh, the redox processes operating in platelets in Jonathan Gibbons' lab. Um, Renato has then returned to Brazil and is now working as a postdoc at Francisco Laurinho's lab uh, with his main research focusing on still studying um, uh, redox processes, but this time how they regulate adhesion in diabetes. Um, today, Renato will present his work, which is titled Peri Epicellular Protein Disulfate Isomerase A1 Regulates Platelet Endothelium Interaction in Cells Exposed to High Glucose Levels. Um, Renato, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. It's such an immense pleasure. Very happy to be here. So today I will be talking about my favorite protein called protein disulfide isomerase, PDI, and specifically the extracellular pool of PDI that we call um, periepicellular PEC PDI, and how this protein regulates the ability of platelets to adhere to endothelial cells in a context of high glucose um, levels, hypoglycemia. To begin with, I would like to say that uh, several risk factors um, increase the propensity of an individual to develop ischemic diseases. And we have been interested in one of these risk factors, um, hyperglycemia, not only because of its importance, um, uh, pathophysiological importance, but also because of its epidemiological um, relevance and burden, specifically in the Brazilian population, which is something that we are also investigating. How does it work? So, so the general mechanism that, that leads to um, ischemic disease from chronic hypoglycemia is um, we start with the formation of an atherosclerotic plaque that will eventually rupture and that will then activate platelets that are circulating. Those platelets will form thrombi that will then impact organs. And all of these processes are highly dependent on the interaction of platelets to endothelial cells as well as platelets to the subendothelium. And these interactions are highly dependent on adhesion molecules on the surface of both of these cells. And we know that PDI associates with several of these adhesion molecules. But what is PDI? And this is the main character of, of our story. This is a rather colorful um, representation of, of PDI. Uh, PDI is an ER in the plasmic reticulum um, resident protein. And basically what it does is it shuffles electrons around. Um, so it can reduce disulfide bonds onto free thiols. It can oxidize free thiols onto disulfide bonds. It can isomerize disulfide bonds, which is shuff shuffle things around to help folding proteins as well as activate things like integrins. On the outside of the cell, um, PDI has been um, implicated in several pathologies and um, I specifically have been interested in how PEC PDI regulates thrombus formation for the past however many years. Uh, so that led us to hypothesize that this extracellular PDI, this PEC PDI can regulate adhesion molecules on the surface of endothelial and platelets um, that may ultimately influence the binding of these cells in hyperglycemia. Our experimental design as of now is rather simplistic. Um, we have HUVEX. Some HUVEX are left on their normal glucose media. Others are exposed to high glucose levels. And then a fraction of those are um, treated with PDI inhibitors or, or their respective controls. We also have some cells exposed to osmotic pressure, um, what we call as an osmotic pressure control, so mannitol, um, but I'm not going to show here just, just because it, um, for the sake of time. And this is the first and, in my opinion, most important experiment of this project so far. Here we have collected blood from healthy donors, um, washed platelets, and then left the platelets to stick on top of a HUVEX 
monolayer, similar to what Camilla was showing, but in this case, static. Um, and then we have normal glucose cells on the upper left and then high glucose um, cells on the, on the upper right. And you see that the amount of platelets adhered is uh, increased. And not only that, but there's these platelet aggregates or, or thrombi, if you may. And that is then uh, reversed uh, in the presence of Bepristat, which is a whole cell PDI inhibitor. Uh, in the presence of an anti-PDI antibody clone RL90, which doesn't enter the cells, therefore inhibits PEC-PDI, as well as in the presence of CXXC PEP, which is a petitent peptide that we have developed that also does not enter the cell and also binds to PEC-PDI. We use different strategies to inhibit PEC-PDI because of, um, um, of, of what these things are. One is an antibody and the other is a peptide and, and they have limitations. But this experiment is specifically um, the inhibitors were in contact with both QVEX and endothelial cells. So really the first question that we asked was, well, okay, so it, is, it, is it platelet PDI or is it endothelial PDI? So what happens when we inhibit platelet PDI specifically? So we incubate platelets with the inhibitors, we wash the inhibitors away, and then we um, left those platelets to adhere um, to QVEX exposed either to normal or high glucose um, levels. And what we see is um, when only platelet PDI is inhibited, we don't really see uh, a decrease in the amount or number of platelets adhered onto these HUVEX. However, on, on, on the other hand, when, when we knock PDI down using siRNA, we see a similar effect to that first result slide that I was just showing you. That is, there is, a reduced number of platelets adhered. So that led us to conclude that it's the endothelial PDI that's relevant here and maybe not um, the platelet PDI. Uh, one thing that I would like to um, um, bring your attention to is, is these, you, you can see that these cells, they make these protrusions and um, you see quite a lot of platelets stuck um, along those protrusions and that, that's something that we see um, throughout our different experiments. We are also interested in, in that, although I'm not gonna um, um, share much about it, um, but we can talk about it if you want. So we are now focusing on QVEX and, and what PDI does to these cells. And when we think about the extracellular portion of it, um, of PDI, we are interested in how that their membrane is affected both physically from a physical perspective, but also from a biochemical perspective. So first thing we did was we decided to look at actin. So we probed for F-actin using phalloidin. And you can see that high glucose cells, they form these thick actin fibers that are not really um, prevalent in, in normal glucose cells. When whole cell PDI is inhibited with Bepristat, we don't really see those actin fibers. And when PEC PDI is inhibited, we see some fibers, but, but definitely not as many um, as the um, high glucose condition. Those, the formation of these actin fibers are correlated with um, increased adhesiveness and focal adhesion. So we decided to probe for phospho-fac uh, phospho um, to look at focal adhesions. And what we see is, um, that high glucose cells, they form these sort of chunky, um, somewhat cylindrical um, post, um, focal adhesions um, that are not really present in normal glucose cells and that are spread um, throughout the um, affecting uh, stress fibers. That is obviously uh, reduced in the presence of a whole cell PDI inhibitor as well as in the presence of um, uh, PEC PDI inhibitor. Uh, next, we decided to, we're now trying to understand what is going on, right? So, so the molecular mechanisms that give support to the effect that we are observing. Uh, and so we decided to look at the production of hydrogen peroxide um, because that gives support to pretty much everything I was just, uh, I, I've been showing you now. And here we measured um, hydrogen peroxide generation using Amplex Red. And these graphs are showing you the amount of fluorescence 
um, that was inhibited in the presence of catalase compared to a same condition without catalase. So you see that high glucose cells produce more hydrogen peroxide um, that is then inhibited in the presence of whole cell PDI. It's also inhibited in the presence of um, uh, PEC PDI inhibitor. So probably this increased ROS generation and the reversion of this um, by PDI, PDI inhibition um, is implicated in the cytoskeletal reorganization and increased adhesiveness that we, we observe with these cells. But then the final piece of result that I'm going to show you today um, has to do with the physical aspect of what um, we're interested in. So we have performed an atomic force microscopy experiment. And as the name implies, it allows you to measure uh, atomic forces. <laughs> uh, first, a qualitative uh, analysis. So on your left, you see that normal glycemic cells, um, this is what a, a normal membrane should look like. And you see these um, um, prolonged structures along those um, normal glucose cells. You can also see that um, evidently, uh, when cells are exposed to high glucose levels, their membrane are, to the very least, different. They have the, uh, we're not sure what these things are. Um, maybe they are acting nodules, maybe they are focal adhesions, maybe they're something else, but it's, it's drastically different from what we observe with control cells. When whole cell PDI is inhibited, that then brings the membrane of these cells back to look like um, a, a normal glucose um, cell. And then when PEC PDI is inhibited, sort of in the middle, but again, uh, different from what we see when um, um, these cells um, do not have their PEC PDI inhibited. And then on your right, um, one of the measurements that we have performed is uh, the stiffness of the membrane of these HUVEX. And you can see that HUVEX that were subjected, that, that had their PEC PDI inhibited, were less stiff than those that were not. Um, and probably that influences the ability of platelets to bind to these cells. Uh, we are now trying to dissect more of the physical properties um, implicated in this, as well as the molecular um, targets that may explain all of these all of these effects. So I would like to conclude by saying that, well, our overarching conclusion is that PEC PDI is, is an upstream regulator of platelet endothelium interaction in hypoglycemia. Um, this effect that we observe is uh, regulated by integrin activation. We have data here. So for instance, we know that these cells, the high, high glucose cells, stick more onto um, different matrices like collagen and fibrinogen. And then when you, when you inhibit PDI, that's reduced. We also know that um, PDI binds to some integrins and um, that's reduced in the presence of these inhibitors. So we, we're now dissecting the molecular mechanisms involved. But we're also interested in things that are secreted by these UVEX. And that's, what, that's why I was bringing your attention to those prolongaments, because um, we believe that um, cells secrete different proteins and, and things and cargo through those prolongaments. Um, so we've now performed a, a proteomics um, of the secreted proteins, and, and there's just a lot of uh, fun, interesting stuff there. Um, having said that, I, I would like to, my final message is to say that I'm open to collaborate. Should you have any questions, should you want um, to talk about this, um, just send me an email. And finally, I'd like to thank all of these beautiful individuals from the Vascular Biology Lab uh, at the University of Sao Paulo um, for all the support and camaraderie, and uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Renata, for this uh, great talk. Um, so now we'll have our final speaker, and uh, this is Ruth Walker from the University of, uh, uh, University of Newcastle. Uh, Ruth received her Master of Science degree in biochemistry from the University of Birmingham, in the UK, and since 2019, she's been working as a PG student in the TROST lab uh, for the biomedical mass spectrometry at the University of Newcastle. 
She is collaborating with Berenger Ingelheim to develop Malditov mass spectrometry assays, which would uh, facilitate drug discovery. And her today's talk is titled Developing High Throughput Screening Malditov MS, Cellular Assay for Drug Discovery in Non Alcoholic Fatty Liver Disease. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. So, why do I actually care about non alcoholic fatty liver disease? Well, non alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD, actually affects uh, one in four people in the UK and it's associated with metabolic syndrome, so obesity, type 2 diabetes, and things like this, which are more prevalent in the Western world, in non Western countries. It's actually a spectrum of disease, from healthy to an accumulation of fats in the liver, fats plus inflammation, and then you get to fibrosis, cirrhosis, and this can lead to liver failure, liver cancer, and if you don't get a transplant, death. <laughs> so it's actually um, currently the second most uh, used uh, cause for, for liver transplants at the moment, and it's set to become the first uh, most cause for, for liver transplant in the next few years. But it currently has no specific treatment um, or, and it's not very well understood how the progression actually happens between these different stages. However, they do result in a change in metabolites and the proteins between the different conditions. And this is what I'm looking at in drug discovery. So in drug discovery, the idea is you identify a target protein or a target pathway that you want to target, identify a hope a hit through high throughput screens and then take this hit forward so that with an end goal of actually producing the drug for the patients. However, this is a very expensive and long process as I'm sure many of you are aware. So I'm focused on the high throughput screening uh, part of this pathway and the identifying part of the hits. So current uh, methods um, involve things such as enzymes, um, fluorescence, antibody assays, and colorimetric tests. However, these methods are, are quite indirective. They're often expensive to both use and develop, and um, they can be uh, susceptible to compound-dependent screening artifacts, leading to, po to false positives and false negatives, therefore requiring additional analysis than you've already done. And this is where my research is focused because mass spectrometry offers the potential to change this as it offers a label, screen, a label free um, sensitive method to do this. And I, in particular, I use Malditoff mass spectrometry. So what is Malditoff mass spectrometry? It's matrix assisted laser desorption ionization time of flight mass spectrometry. And this means that it's a soft ionization technique that often results in the, in the formation of intact ions rather than um, ion fragments as, you, as seen in most other mass spectrometry methods. As I've already mentioned, it's label free, it's fast and it's very sensitive. And what, and what you can see from these plates, which is where we spot our samples, it requires very minimal sample so you can spot 200 nanoliters or 100 nanoliters depending on um, the uh, plates that you're using and it's also very quick so courtesy of some of our collaborators in gsk this is actually um, a high throughput screen that you can actually see going on on a maldi um, so it's very quick in its acquisition of um, data so how does it actually work and what can it be used for. So it can be used for many different analytes. So it can be used for proteins, peptides, lipids, or small molecules. And all you do is change the matrix used. So what happens is you mix your sample with the matrix and then onto the sample, the metal plate, which I've already mentioned. A laser will then come and ionize this. Um, and then it will lead it to detection in the mass spectrometer. And, it's, and in this, it's usually coupled with a time of flight mass spectrometer, which means that when the laser hits the sample and ionizes it, the, these particles get accelerated before they eventually hit the detector. 
and then this is where you get your m over z or your mass to charge ratio um, so that you can actually identify the different molecules so currently um, Maldi-Toff mass spectrometry is actually used in the hospital um, to identify if you have a type of bacterial infection. So the spectra that is actually produced is as unique to the bacteria as your fingerprint is to you. So this is often called um, a spectral fingerprint. Maldi imaging is also another way that it's used um, and often what you can actually see is you can actually look at the individual m over z values and see where in your specimen they might actually be so each of these sections shows a different m over z value and that can give you massive insight into the spatial awareness of metabolites and different molecules in your tissues this is you can also stain your samples to add another level of detail to this in drug discovery, however, the most common method that is actually used is enzyme assays, so where you take your enzyme and your substrate, and it might produce a spectra like this, where you'd see your substrate, then the reaction would occur, and then you'd get different peaks for your product and your substrate, so you'd be able to actually measure the substrate product ratio and therefore have a quantitative readout. By combining um, bits of all of this, we decided we asked the question, can this actually be applied to cellular models? Um, so can we take the fingerprint from the bacteria and take some of the other aspects forward? And so when we do this, we treat our cells in cell culture, mix the sample with matrix and spot them on our target plate, and then we collect the data using the instrument. And this actually allows us to do a spectral fingerprint comparison between an untreated, um, a disease stimuli uh, cell and a disease stimulus plus an inhibitor or an activator, some sort of compound that you're trying to screen. And from this, you can actually identify the different features that change, classify these features, and then hopefully identify the HIP. So you can actually look at this another way as well, using principal component analyses. And when you do this, you'd have your healthy control cells, um, and then you can potentially identify good inhibitors or potential new inhibitors of a different, um, of X, for example. You can also multiplex this and actually see if these are known toxic compounds, would my new inhibitor actually fall within this region, which would give you a greater level of insight into the data and potentially allow you to identify drugs that might not get further down into the process because that's expensive as well. So what actually is this principal component analysis? So what you do is you take the, um, the spectra and you actually compare the different peaks to each other. So this might be biomarker one, where you see you've got a difference in the disease stimulus, and this might be biomarker two. And what you do is you take these different features and you actually plot them on axes um, after, because what actually happens is each of these features um, falls into different dimensions. And within all of these dimensions, it actually allows you to classify where they actually fall in relation to one another. So when it does this, it says, I'm going to take the most um, changes that actually happen in dimension one, and then and the next most in dimension two, and so on and so forth. However, for us to look with 100 different dimensions is a lot. So the top three dimensions, or looking in 3D, um, tends to look at over about 90% of the differences, which allows you to actually look at the differences and to actually classify them on the axes and see, are they similar? Are they different? So how have we actually applied this to NAFLD? Um, so we've taken our untreated control, We've got our fibrosis stimulus with TGF-beta and PDGF-beta, 
as our disease stimuli. And then I've got an inhibitor version with ALK5, which inhibits the TGF beta, and a matinib, which inhibits the PDGF. And using this, these models, we've actually looked at some key markers for NAFLD. And what you can see is when you look at the, um, the fibrosis stimuli, it's upregulated significantly in these models. And with the inhibitors, it's brought down to a similar level to the control. So when we actually do this in our cells, we treat the cells, we then spot them, we mix them with our matrix and we spot them on the MALDI. And then we look at them in two regions. So first in a metabolite region. So this would be a region which contains, say, lipids. Um, and then we look at them also in the protein region. And what you can see from both of these is a clear clustering of the control, the fibrosis stimulus, and the fibrosis stimulus plus your inhibitors. However, in an ideal world, the control and the fibrosis stimulus and the, in, and the inhibitors would cluster. And they don't in this case. And that's because ALK5 and imatinib are not ideal inhibitors for this. So what we thought is we'd look at some inhibitors that are currently in clinical trials. So we looked at lanfibrinor, which is a pan-PPAR agonist, and Aramcol, which targets um, the sterile CoA desaturase 1. And both of these are, um, are currently in clinical trials for liver fibrosis. We also looked at um, potentially redeploying piferidone, which is currently used to, um, clinically to treat um, lung fibrosis. And when you actually look at these, what you can see is in the black, you have the control, and then pink is um, plus the piferidone, green is plus the aramcol, and orange is plus the lanfibrinor. And what you can see is over here, you have the TGF beta PDGF, and you can see the clear differences between them. And when you look at these potential biomarkers, you can see the clear clustering there as well. So how can we take this forward and how, how far have we gotten? So we've established a phenotypic cellular assay for antifibrotic drug discovery in the liver using maldi toff mass spectrometry. We've shown the metabolite and protein separation of the fibrosis with inhibitors by um, this method, and we've validated it with drugs currently in clinical trials. And we're going to take this forward by identifying the biomarkers that we've that are there, and by performing a small scale screen with open me compounds before we before I'm headed to Boeing at Ingelheim next year to, to use this to perform a larger screen with hopefully some of their more automated robots. So I'd just like to thank all of my lab group um, and funders from BI and the EPSRC. And I'd also like to say, if you're interested in any of this, or you know anybody who might be interested, we also have two industrial PhD positions available to start um, September next year. So thank you for listening. And I think we're now on to the question part of, for all three of us. Yeah, thank you, Ruth, for a very interesting talk. So please welcome other uh, speakers to the session. So now we have the time for several questions. We have 15 minutes. Um, so I can see that we have two questions in the chat, so please ask more, we need more questions. So the first one is from Gareth Langley and it is to, for Camilla, and the question is as follows. Have you looked at the ECM makeup of the 3D model in any great detail? For example, do you see a healthy collagen for network? Thank you for uh, your question. Uh, yes, we looked at the 3D ECM uh, uh, fibers. Uh, the first uh, uh, models we did, we did using fibrin, that is the most used 3D, let's say, support to build up the uh, tubing, so the 3D cylindrical monolayer. And then we used uh, collagen, 70% collagen. And in the 70% collagen, uh, we observed the fiber. However, uh, we didn't cut it yet to do, for example, immunostaining for 
extracellular matrix released by either endothelial cells and or pericyte because uh, the size of the 3D uh, model is 140 micron, so it's like two airs together uh, and long five millimeters. And we have still to find a way to cut the PDMS with the uh, let's say tube without damaging the, uh, the collagen and the cells. So we can do it as only live and uh, at the moment live we did only the fiber at the resonant uh, confocal microscope. Uh, uses, so all we studied only the fiber geometry within the 3D model. Is it, this is answered it? Okay, uh, let's wait, maybe there'll be some comment. I have another question. So if you think about microvasculature, different tissues, obviously, you know, in brain, BBB is very hardly permeable to anything. So do you see in your sort of 3D in vitro models, the same kind of dependence on, depending on where the cell come from, do they show the sort of relative permeability of the, of the structures or it's not yet conserved in the simple models like that? Well, let's say we now used only primary uvec and uh, and brain endothelium. We didn't use yet lung in 3D, uh, but of course I expect uh, different permeability. Uh, of course, the brain endothelial are a little bit slower to grow. So as you can, uh, I show it is after five days, we do permeability assay, while for the UVEC, we did, we did after three days. I have to say that because of the geometry that is more, uh, let's say, in vivo-like, uh, these cells permeability is uh, really lower. So they are tighter. So compared to any um, uh, tran transwell or what any other um, experimental device they used uh, before. So because of their geometry, uh, they are like tighter. And for, for um, also the UVEC are shown very tight barriers, so very low permeability. Okay, then do you think that like the adding the other cell types like pericytes and astrocytes would change that? Uh, yeah, at the moment, so we did the experiment with the pericytes. However, the pericytes, uh, when the, the number of pericytes I showed you, uh, that is quite high density, they moved quite a lot in the extracellular matrix and therefore we have to find a way, sorry, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, um, so we can uh, uh, measure the permeability and look the same, but I think because they move the extracellular matrix and therefore they move also the cells in the tube. Uh, so we were now we are working on it and seeding the uh, pericytes uh, with some enzyme that uh, inhibits, uh, for example, um, metalloproteinases and things like that that uh, moves too much the the gel. Okay, all right. Um... We don't have any other questions for you. Maybe I can ask very one quick one. So when you did this shear stress experiment, when you were showing attachment of the tumor cancer cells to the endothelial uh, cell levels, obviously the shear stress affects different cells, right? So do you think that this sort of sticking is only changes in the endothelial cells, or there's also change in the cancer cell upon shear stress, which makes them more sticky to the endothelial monolayer, you know? Yeah. The shear stress I apply is quite uh, short because it's five minutes. So the mechanotransduction is there, but uh, is not completely activated like long-term shear stress. I think both uh, endothelial cells and cancer cells under shear stress are, let's say, more prone. Uh, to adhere because they are more kind of stimulated, but this is the condition they are, unfortunately, when metastasis happen in the patient. So I think this is a recapitulation to some extent, of course, because uh, uh, 
uh, it, it is difficult to, to measure the real shear stress within the microvascular capillary where metastasis happen in human at the moment. <laughs> Still, we don't have this data and therefore it's difficult to recapitulate. We tried to make with this 3D model the smallest microvasculature possible, but in real life are 7 micron, not under 40 micron. Uh, we tried to, to keep it, to mimic the in vivo situation, uh, taking consideration the technical limitation. But of course, the shear stress is part of this event, this uh, multi-step cascade. And I think uh, both uh, cell types uh, uh, react to it to some, okay. to some extent. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, so I have the uh, so comment from Gareth. So, thank you for the answer. I was thinking more about the disposition of ECM by the model rather than the culture conditions. So, how it compares to the in vivo setting conditions. So sorry, rather the 3D so than not, to... So not the ECM which you provide to create the model, but actually how the endothelial cells themselves sort of modulate and create the ECM. So they secrete uh, for sure the ECM, uh, both laminin, fibronectin and collagen, uh, seeding the endothelial cells in different uh, extracellular matrices. So for example, if you seed in collagen, they secrete fibronectin and laminin and so on. So the, these endothelial cells are able to secrete, uh, at least in the apical side, um, extracellular matrix components that normally are present in the different tissue. We don't know, we were not able to measure uh, within the different tissue types the different amount of each component, let's say. We know that there is, is expressed, but uh, we don't there is no such differences uh, also because the cells at the beginning were not culture under shear stress we introduced the, uh, the shear stress once the monolayer was formed but despite that still the endothelial cells secrete uh, extracellular components all right thank you let's move to to renata now we have question again from gareth so uh, the question is as follows pdi is a subunit of the collagen prolyl hydroxylase tetramer could PDI inhibition be affecting the amount of collagen production and affecting the stiffness? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. That's something that we are very much interested in. So there is one paper from 2019 showing that PDI probably binds to collagen 6. Um, um, PDI is involved in collagen maturation inside the cell, um, but we don't really know whether it binds to the collagen on the outside of the cell. Um, we have data showing that PDI binds to collagen on the outside of the cell. Um, permanently reduced PDI binds to it more than oxidized PDI. Uh, but having said that, this uh, we did perform proteomics of secreted proteins, um, and collagen is one of those. Uh, and PDI inhibition does not seem to influence the amount of collagen that is secreted by these proteins, but it does influence the amount of laminin. So that's uh, that's one of the interesting things we are looking at. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I have uh, maybe more general questions. So if you you showed this uh, slide at the beginning of your presentation about different pathological situations where PDI is, is sort of implicated. So in this situation, do you know if this PDI is actually actively secreted or is just leaking out from the cells and does the bad thing or is anything known about it? It is actively secreted. That's one of the uh, many projects from, from our lab and, and others. Uh, we know that PDI is secreted um, inside microvesicles, for instance. Um, so it's, it's not a passive thing. It's actively secreted. Okay. And then later on, the, the sort, of, sort of pathological action is the enzymatic action, or it works as a scaffold or both? Sorry, I didn't get that. So when when it is already secreted and sticks to the cells, does it then and you know exerts its activity as an enzyme, oh, yeah. or is the mm -hmm. scaffold for binding other stuff around the cell and sort of making the platelet stick? Is mm -hmm. it known? Yeah. It? Yes, we do know that, um, for instance, PDI inside microvesicles of platelets, they have reductive activity. They are able to, um, you know, 
do what they're supposed to do, which is reduce their sulfide bonds. Um, so yes, whether it's a scaffold to anchor other you know, proteins, you know, intergreens, whatever, we don't know that yet. That's, that's actually a very interesting hypothesis. I've never thought about it, but uh, yeah, it definitely has enzyme activity. All right, and so I have one last question up to you. Um, so when you were treating with the inhibitors and you saw the changes in in in, in sort of the the focal adhesion and so on, so so because probably the focal adhesion was the effect of the intracellular PDI, right, rather than extracellular, or was it extracellular affecting the mm. focal adhesion? Do you know that, or is the combined effect of the and intra? Yeah. Complicated, isn't it? It's it's hard, yeah, hard it to, is, yeah. To, to yeah. But uh, so so my hypothesis at the moment we haven't um, dissected that yet. My hypothesis at the moment is that um, so these cells are cultured, adhered onto glass, and the main mechanism that that uh, supports this adhesion is uh, integrin. So integrins they allow the, the cell to stick to glass um, because PDI uh, influences integrin activation, and because when you inhibit PEC PDI, less integrin is activated. Then you know that's one possible um, mechanism. And uh, we are interested in one specific integrin alpha five. Um, but yeah, we, yeah, that's as much as I know. All right. Okay. Save the work to do. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ranta. So now, Ruf, so uh, we haven't got any questions in the chat, but I have two. So um, I was thinking, because if you look at this sort of phenotypic screen when you don't really look for one particular change, right? It's not like one enzyme activity, you look for many things changing the cell. If you compare that with sort of more directed measures like you know, ELISA or some enzyme activity, I mean, do you know, I mean, maybe from the experience or experience of preengineering harm of GSK, how often you can get better hits using the mass spec possibly, or how better you can have drugs using you know, the simple methods for the measurements of the activity? Is there any sort of, is there a precedence for that? Is it known, I mean, that actually the mass spec will give you advantage? Yeah, the mass spectrometry definitely gives you um, advantages because um, as I said, most of the methods that have been developed, so quite a lot of, enzyme assays are out there are on ELISAs or with fluorescence or different enzymes as you say however um, when you actually use the MALDI and you get all of the phenotypic data from that um, it actually gives you um, a much deeper level of data that you get from doing an ELISA and often the hits that you get from that are you identify hits that you don't identify in other methods as it's more sensitive um, but also lots of these methods that have been developed they've been compared to because they've been developed because it's actually cheaper to do MALDI than it is to do many of these other assays so it's actually an advantage to develop a MALDI assay anyway even if you have the other assay so lots of people have developed assays um, for the MALDI that are correspond to the enzyme assay and most of them actually work a lot better um, to actually identify hits that have been taken forward. So, yeah. Okay. And possibly, I mean, if you think about later on, if you have already hits, you can also maybe look deeper into mode of action of the drug, right? Because you have more changes, so you can look actually what is happening on the molecular levels and so on, right? Yeah, it gives you a lot more information. And it's one of the reasons why when we actually said, let's have a look at some of the drugs that are in clinical trials. The ones that we've picked have all got different mechanisms, which is actually quite interesting as well um, when you look at the data that you get from those as well. So, yeah. Okay. Right. Actually, I missed one question for Renato, a very quick one. So, PDI is also important for protein folding. Does ER stress alters expression or trafficking of uh, pre-cellular PDI? Sorry. For... So, uh, so, is the question if if the cells are under ER stress when I when I inhibit PDI. So so the PDI is important for the protein folding. Does ER stress alter the expression or trafficking of PDI? Oh yes, um, yes it does. Uh, that's again um, someone else's project. <laughs> uh, it does alter. Uh, it seems to go to the cytosol. It seems to be expo exported to again actively um, secreted by cells under ER stress. Um, our cells are not under ER stress, um, even with this high glucose uh, intervention or even with the PDI inhibition. Um, that's something I was careful about because I know that this was, you know, a potential um, 
I think that would complicate me in the future. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. All right, okay. Thank you all for attending this uh, this webinar. Just a few comments at the end. So we can continue the conversation online on Twitter. We have the the handles at BiochemSoc and uh, PPP Publishing at um, on the Twitter. We also welcome all the suggestions, as I mentioned before, for the new topics and speakers. And if you want to propose your own uh, subject or your own talk, you can go to the uh, website with the webinars and do that. And also you can look at all the upcoming future webinars, actually also view the, the past seminars uh, which are recorded uh, on the YouTube channel. And uh, finally, uh, you can become the member of the Biochemical Society and join the community of researchers. And there are benefits which come with that. You can have discount registration for the conferences, meetings, and also, for, you know, exclusive grants and bursaries uh, and some journals. So please uh, have a look at the website and join if you if you'd like to. And on that, I would like to finish. It's one minute by four. Thank you again for the speakers and the participants and see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.